is in most in it's need. It's being 2 p.m. The debate is interrupted. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. I inform the House that the Minister for Defence will be absent from question time this week as he is attending the NATO Defence Minister's meeting in Brussels. The Minister for Home Affairs and Justice and Defence Materiel will be acting as Minister for Defence during this time and will answer questions on behalf of the Minister for Defence. The Attorney General will be absent from question time today as she is attending the swearing in of Stephen Gagler to the High Court of Australia. The Minister for Home Affairs and Justice and Defence Materiel will answer questions on behalf of the Attorney General. The Minister for School Education, Early Childhood and Youth will be absent from question time this week for personal reasons. The Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Financial Services and Superannuation will answer questions on his behalf. Are there any questions without notice? The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Madam Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister continue to have full confidence in the Speaker? Uh, if not, what steps will she take to remove him from the Speakership? The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And, uh, I understand why the Leader of the Opposition has asked this question today. Of course, uh, what would be on his mind, and he's made some public comments about this today, is the uh, publication of some text messages uh, from Mr Slipper, a number of them from the time before when he was Speaker. Uh, the contents of these text messages are offensive. I find sexism offensive wherever it comes from. I do believe sexism is always offensive. You would expect me as the first woman Prime Minister of this country to say that. Uh, on matters involving the Speaker more generally, uh, as the Leader of the Opposition would be aware, the material he is referring to is material from a court case uh, where the judge at the moment has reserved his decision. So I don't believe that it's appropriate for this parliament to canvass in a fulsome way uh, this material which is in evidence in a case where the judge has reserved his decision. Is the Leader of the Opposition seeking a supplementary? Uh, I'm actually asking leave, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, to, uh, ask, to move a motion. Uh, the I of the ask Opposition leave, has the call. I ask leave to move the following motion, that as provided for by section 35 of the Constitution, the Speaker be removed from office immediately. Yeah. 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 What? You're, You're not, not going to take this. You're You're Leave is not granted. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. No confidence motion. Uh, Madam, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I, order, I move. Order. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. I, I move that so much of standing and session orders be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition from moving the following motion forthwith. That as provided for by section 35 of the Constitution, the Speaker be removed from office immediately. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, uh, this is uh, obviously uh, a rare and unusual step that I take at the start of question time today, but it is a necessary step. It is necessary that this parliament now suspend standing orders and consider the removal of the Speaker from the high office that he currently holds. Madam Deputy Speaker, it's clear that this Speaker is no longer a fit and proper person to uphold the dignity of the parliament. It's clear that he is no longer a fit and proper person to uphold the standing orders of this House. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, this Speaker the is member for disqualified. Isaacs. He is disqualified from high office, not by the fact of the legal action currently on foot against him. But he is disqualified by the undenied, uncontradicted facts that have emerged in the course of this case. First, Madam Deputy Speaker, there are the truly gross references uh, to female genitalia. I regret to, to speak in this way to this House, but it is necessary, Madam Deputy Speaker, to prosecute uh, this matter. The vile the vile Order. and topically specific language to which this speaker appears to be addicted 
And finally, and no less important, Madam Deputy Speaker, they, the clear bias, the clear bias on the face of the record shown by the Speaker against a member of this chamber that he had expelled that day. Madam Deputy Speaker, standing orders must be suspended because this Speaker has failed the character test. Standing orders must also be suspended because, I regret to say, not only has the Speaker failed the character test, but the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister has failed the judgment test. That's why standing orders uh, should be suspended. This Prime Minister failed the judgment test when it came to the member for Dobell. Now she has failed the judgment test when it comes to the Speaker of this Parliament for, for months and years. This Prime Minister ran a protection racket for the member for Dobell. Please, please, Madam Deputy Speaker, let's not have the same protection racket run for the benefit of the current Speaker of this Parliament. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, let's be clear exactly what happened in this place last November. Last November, and this is why standing orders must be suspended, the Prime Minister did a squalid deal to boost her numbers in this parliament. She knew that the government was about to lose the support of the member for Denison. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. The Leader of the House is seeking the call. Deputy Speaker, thank you. Uh, we will take the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition and there will be uh, four speakers aside, ten minutes each. Is the, sorry, is the motion seconded? For the suspension. The motion is seconded. No, 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 no. We're going to. Sorry, could the deputy leader of the opposition? We're going to. Yes, I know. Could the? Yes. So we're we're in a very we're in new territory. We are going to go back. The suspension will not proceed. We will go back to the original seeking of leave. We will start the clocks again. The leader of the opposition will have the opportunity to begin his remarks as if leave had been granted. The well, Leader of the Opposition you, has the call. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I move that, as provided for by section 35 of the Constitution, the Speaker be removed from office immediately. And at the risk of detaining the House uh, in a repetitive way, let me say, Madam Deputy Speaker, that it is absolutely crystal clear that this Speaker is no longer a fit and proper person to uphold the dignity of this parliament and is no longer a fit and proper person to uphold and protect the standing orders of this house and i say madam deputy speaker that the speaker is not disqualified by the mere fact of a legal action against him that can befall any member of this house and of itself should not be a disqualification from high office. What, Madam Deputy Speaker, must nevertheless be held against this Speaker are the undenied, uncontradicted facts that have emerged, which continue to emerge in the course of the case are currently on foot against the Speaker of this Parliament, at the risk, Madam Deputy Speaker, of dismaying this chamber. At the risk, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, of dismaying the public, I must allude, and I only allude, to the gross references to female genitalia which are contained in the uncontradicted, undenied evidence uh, before the court about the conduct of this speaker. Uh, I must allude, Madam Deputy Speaker, to the vile anatomical references uh, to which uh, this speaker appears to be addicted uh, in his text message. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, there is the clear bias, the clear bias in undenied, uncontradicted evidence before a court uh, against a member of this House by someone who is charged to act without fear or favour, by someone who is charged to act impartially towards all members of this House, by someone who is charged with the upholding of the standing orders of this House without fear or favour against or in favour of any single member, be you the newest member, be you the father of the House, the Speaker is charged with upholding the standing orders impartially 
are for and against all members of this parliament and on the face of the uncontradicted, undenied evidence before a court, this speaker cannot do that. This speaker has not done that. That is why, Madam Deputy Speaker, this particular speaker is no longer a fit and proper person uh, to be the Speaker of this House. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, it's not just the Speaker who has failed the character test. It is indeed this Prime Minister who has failed the judgment test. This Prime Minister hand-picked the current Speaker for the top job of this parliament. This Prime Minister orchestrated the resignation of the former Speaker, the member for Scullin, uh, a man of undoubted character, a man of undoubted quality and a man of undoubted impartiality in the conduct of this chamber. Does, does anyone think for a second that the member for Scullin, a man who loved this parliament, who loved the speakership as he loved his life, does anyone think uh, the former Speaker of the Parliament would have resigned to spend more time with his colleagues in the caucus? <laughs> ask Darrell. I mean, ask, ask the member for Banks uh, what caucus is like these days. Does anyone think that the member for Scullin really resigned to spend time with members of the caucus? Clearly, uh, the member for Scullin resigned the Speakership because he had been instructed by the Prime Minister. A Prime Minister who engaged and who masterminded a squalid deal to shore up her numbers in the parliament. And mark my words, Madam Deputy Speaker, mark my words, Madam Deputy Speaker, what we will shortly see from this Prime Minister uh, and ministers in this government is a defence of the indefensible, is an attempt to say that someone who has clearly failed the character test is worthy of sitting in the greatest chair of this parliament. Well, I say to this Prime Minister, just as the Speaker has failed the character test, you, Prime Minister, are about to fail the judgment test. And every day that you, Prime Minister, run a protection racket for the current Speaker, just as you ran for months and years a protection racket for the member of Do for Dobell, you indicate your unfitness for high office as well. Madam Deputy Speaker, last November, when the Prime Minister feared she was about to lose the support of the member for Denison uh, because she knew she would not be able to, to deliver uh, on her poker machine pledge, she cooked up this deal. She knew she was about to lose the support of the member for Denison. She feared she was about to lose the support in the parliament of the member for Dobell. She was apprehensive then, as always, about the actions of the former oh, Prime Minister, the member for Griffiths. So, in conjunction with the Leader of the House, the member for Graindler, she dreamt up this brilliant political wheeze. She dreamt up this brilliant political tactic, never mind if it involved the political assassination of a well-respected Speaker of this Parliament. She knew that she could rely, then as always, on the Sussex Street death squad that had already dispatched one Prime Minister to deal with a Speaker of this Parliament. Never mind, never mind that the squalid deal that the Prime Minister cooked up last November involved placing in the chair of this Parliament someone whom her own government someone whom her own government was investigating uh, for misuse of entitlements all that mattered to this prime minister all that mattered to this prime minister last november when this brilliant uh, piece of political maneuvering was being dreamt up was buttressing her position in the parliament that's all that ever matters to this prime minister her own survival in this parliament. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, what is now absolutely apparent is that while members on this side of the House were attempting to manoeuvre the Speaker out of the parliament, the Prime Minister and members on the other side of the parliament were giving him the biggest job in this parliament, apart from the Prime Ministership itself. 
and in the process of managing the Speaker, not out of the parliament, but into the Speakership, this Prime Minister dudded a good Labor man who had done nothing, nothing at all, but discharged the duties of the Speakership in a fair and impartial manner. Not sufficiently partial to satisfy the Prime Minister and the Leader of this House. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, let be, let's be absolutely crystal clear about the situation in this parliament right now. This speaker is this Prime Minister's creation. This speaker's actions are this Prime Minister's responsibility, and this speaker's standards per force are this Prime Minister's standards unless, unless she has the responsibility and the decency to remove this speaker from his high office. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, we know, we know, because uh, we have been observing this Prime Minister now for a long time in this parliament, we know that sorry is the one word she can't say. We know I was wrong is the one statement that she can't make. Well, I say to this Prime Minister, please, for the sake of this parliament, for the sake of this country, for the sake of ordinary standards of decency, admit that you got it wrong when you engineered uh, the member for Fisher into the Speaker's chair and just say sorry. Just apologise to this parliament for the travesty that you have inflicted on us back in November last year. Madam Deputy Speaker, as things stand, this whole sorry slipper saga just illustrates the ethical, the ethical bankruptcy of this government. We've had minister after minister uh, just about knocking over the microphones uh, to stand up uh, for this speaker. We've had minister after minister tripping over themselves uh, to defend uh, this speaker. We had the minister for Foreign Affairs describing um, uh, the accuser uh, of the Speaker as more rehearsed than a kabuki actor. Uh, we had the Leader of the House saying that anyone who criticised the current Speaker was guilty of engaging in the politics of personal destruction. We even had the Leader of the House uh, compare court action against the current Speaker to Watergate. I mean, what sense of standard? What sense of proportion? What sense of perspective uh, do these people have? But worst of all, Madam Deputy Speaker, worst of all, Madam Deputy Speaker, we had the one person in this House most charged with respecting due process, with respecting the ordinary processes of the courts, the first law officer of the Crown, the first law officer of this country, the Attorney General herself who went out in public again and again and again and again uh, to say that those who were engaged in uh, prosecuting this speaker were somehow guilty of an abusive, abusive process. She didn't say it once. It wasn't a slip of the tongue in the heat of the moment. She went out and said it deliberately, cold-bloodedly and calculatedly again and again and again and again. Uh, and when the Attorney General was picked up uh, for commentary. And it's interesting, isn't it, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the Prime Minister herself, the Prime Minister herself uh, is now saying, oh, I couldn't possibly comment on something which is before the courts. Oh no, not me, not me. Uh, upholder of standards, upholder of decency, always wanting to give someone a fair go. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, this is what the Attorney General said uh, when picked up on the fact that uh, she was prejudging a matter before the courts. The Attorney General said, "I think it's unrealistic, given the public interest in this matter, that there will not be commentary." And wasn't there commentary, Madam Deputy Speaker? There was comment after comment after comment. There was defamation after defamation after defamation of someone whose only fault was seeking to assert his rights, his rights at law against the Speaker of this parliament. But what's happened? 
What's happened, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, since more has been revealed about the real character, the real nature of the individual who holds the highest job that this parliament can bestow upon anyone? What's happened is that the Attorney General has now taken the vows of a Trappist monk. The Attorney General has now taken the vow of silence on this matter uh, that the Prime Minister is now going to attempt to, to take. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, total, total hypocrisy. This is a government which is only too ready uh, to detect sexism, to detect misogyny no less, until, until Madam Deputy Speaker, they find it in one of their own supporters. Until, Madam Deputy Speaker, they find it in someone upon whom this Prime Minister relies to survive in her job. Then, of course, no fault can possibly be found, no evil dare be spoken. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Australian public are not mugs. They know what is going on here. They know that this government is about to run a protection racket for something which is absolutely contemptible, for attitudes and values which are absolutely and utterly indefensible. Madam Deputy Speaker, not only has the Prime Minister failed the judgment test, not only has the government failed the standards test, but this Attorney General has failed the honour test. She has dishonourably, dishonourably failed to defend the ordinary judicial process of this country. Not only has the Attorney General uh, uh, failed to defend judicial process, she has been the chief defender of the Speaker himself. She has been running his defence rather than defending the courts and the justice process of our country. Madam Deputy Speaker, it is no accident. It is no accident that the member for Banks has today resigned as chairman of the government caucus. It is no accident that the member for Banks has resigned today because the member for Banks must be only too well aware of the fact that back in November last year it was he, the member for Banks, who was forced, who was forced to nominate the current Speaker for the position that he now holds. It was the member for Banks who was forced by this government to endure ten minutes of infamy while he stood in this place, while he stood in this place uh, to assert the virtues of the member for Fisher. Well, he knew it was wrong then. He's, he, he's known that it was wrong every day since then. It's obviously been hanging on his conscience, and now he has resigned. And I'm waiting uh, for the member for Melbourne Ports, uh, who asserted as well the honour of the member for, for Fisher, uh, an assertion that he knew then and has known every day since then to be simply false. So far, so far, the only honourable man opposite in this matter has been the member for Banks, uh, and I commend him. And I commend him uh, for that. Now I know, I know, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the that the Prime Minister is in a difficult position today. She's already lost her caucus chairman. She's fighting to avoid losing her speaker, and ultimately what she is frightened of losing is the support of her caucus too. Well, just as she's lost the caucus chairman, she will lose her speaker, and I suspect <laughs> she will shortly lose the caucus, because what this Prime Minister has done is shame this parliament. And should she rise in this place now to try to defend the speaker, to try to say that she retains confidence in this speaker, she will shame this parliament again. And every day the Prime Minister stands in this parliament to defend this speaker will be another day of shame for this parliament, another day of shame for a government which should already have died of shame. The member for Fisher should never have been. He never have been a speaker in this parliament. He shouldn't have been made speaker last November, 
and he shouldn't be Speaker now. Let me, let me simply remind the Prime Minister, who I presume is about to rise to her feet in this parliament and defend her personal selection of the member for Fisher as Speaker of this place. She said back on the 24th of November last year, she said of this Speaker that he had shown a fierce sense of balance and appropriateness. And appropriateness. This Prime Minister thinks that this Speaker is a man of appropriate judgment. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, what this Prime Minister now needs to do is to defend the conduct, the character and the words of this Speaker. I hear an accusation. How long was he in our party room? We were trying to get him out of our party room, and what did you do? What did members opposite do? They put him, they put him into the biggest, the biggest job in the parliament. This speaker is this Order. Prime Minister's property. The Minister for the Prime Minister, the Minister owns Health. this speaker, and every day the Prime Minister stands in this parliament to defend this speaker, the bonds between them will just be closer. This Prime Minister should be ashamed of herself. She should be ashamed of her choice. She should be ashamed of her judgment. She should be ashamed of the fact that she is now having to defend the indefensible. This speaker should be gone. This speaker should be gone today. Is the motion seconded? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has Madam Deputy Speaker, I second the motion. It is with a heavy heart that I rise to speak on this motion, for it represents a dark and ugly and shameful episode in this parliament. But this motion must be moved because the Prime Minister's choice for Speaker, the member for Fisher, his occupancy of the Speaker's role is no longer tenable. Madam Deputy Speaker, when this House votes to elect a Speaker. A heavy responsibility falls upon the shoulders of the person privileged to take that role. A responsibility to the House, a responsibility to the Parliament and a responsibility to the Australian people. It is among the greatest honours in our parliamentary system to be chosen by peers to hold the most important office in this chamber. It is enshrined, no less, in section 35 of the Constitution that the House of Representatives shall, before proceeding to the dispatch of any other business, choose a member to be the Speaker of the House. This means the Parliament cannot function without first electing a Speaker to preside over the workings of the House. <coughs> the role of the Speaker rests upon 800 years of tradition, harking back to the early genesis of our parliamentary system in England. All nations that have adopted the Westminster system of parliamentary democracy have a speaker playing a critical role as an impartial judge, whose foremost duty is to uphold the dignity of the House, to enforce standards of behaviour and to represent the House and the Parliament in the traditional and ceremonial roles that are required of the speaker. <coughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, the speaker's role in the Westminster system has been described thus. The office of the Speaker occupies a pivotal position in our parliamentary democracy. It has been said of the office of the Speaker that while the members of parliament represent the individual constituencies, the Speaker represents the full authority of the House itself. The Speaker symbolises the dignity and power of the House over which they are presiding. Therefore, it is expected that the holder of this office of high dignity has to be one who can represent the House in all its manifestations. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Speaker can only function if he or she commands the respect of the House. The authority of the Speaker in terms of upholding standards can only be effective if the Speaker has the respect of members. While the parliamentary authority of the Speaker can't be challenged, it can be undermined by the conduct of the person who occupies the chair. Madam Deputy Speaker, while I do not presume 
to speak for all of the female colleagues on either side of the chamber, I would personally struggle to show appropriate respect for the speaker should the member for Fisher return to the role of presiding over question time. How the women in this House are expected to show respect to the speaker when we are now aware of the views that he holds of women is beyond comprehension. The published remarks of the member for Fisher have been read into evidence in a court case. They are uncontested. They are available to the public. They are on a website. They are reported in the media. They are not sub judice. There has been a running commentary on the case involving the member for Fisher and one of his staffers. That running commentary has come from no less a person than the Attorney General, the first law officer in the land. And for the first law officer to think it is appropriate to intervene in proceedings to protect the member for Fisher against a case <coughs> calls into question her fitness for office. But there are legitimate questions being directed to the Attorney-General about why she would intervene in those proceedings to provide special privileges for the member for Fisher that were not afforded to the other litigant in the proceedings. Indeed, the judge in these proceedings has given what I think is an unprecedented statement about the Attorney-General's failure to uphold the dignity of the court, for that is the first duty of the Attorney General of this country. Madam Deputy Speaker, these remarks of the member for Fisher that were read into the court transcript, that are uncontested, that are, are now on the public record, are offensive. Many of them obscenely offensive. What female Labor members would describe as sexist and misogynist if anyone else had uttered them. One comment maliciously attacks a serving female member of parliament while the member for Fisher was occupying the chair as speaker. A malicious, vicious comment showing the partial nature of the member for Fisher's role as speaker. It was not impartial. It was impolite. It was obscene. It makes the member for Fisher's position untenable to occupy the role as speaker. His attitude to women, as revealed in these remarks that are now public, is entirely, absolutely, utterly incompatible with what is expected of the Speaker of the House of Representatives. We do not need to see the outcome of a court case. We do not need to hide behind the fig of sub judice. These comments are public. The public are judging this House and the actions we will take in relation to them. This is also a very serious test for the Prime Minister and for her leadership, because it was the Prime Minister who sanctioned the political deal with the member for Fisher that elevated him to this position of Speaker. The deal was done to allow the Prime Minister to break her written commitment to the member for Denison on gambling reform. I'm sure the member for Denison has not forgotten that betrayal. <coughs> the deal involved the removal of the member for Scullin from the Speakership, a man who had conducted himself and the affairs of the House with enormous dignity, and he had earned the respect of all members. Indeed, I recall at one point the Leader of the Opposition intervening when there was a question of confidence in the Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition intervened when members opposite did not to assure Speaker Scullin that he had, Speaker, the member for Scullin, that he had our support. For the member for Scullin was a decent man, an honourable man. Could anyone in this chamber imagine the member for Scullin making the remarks about women 
that have been made by the member for Fisher, the Prime Minister's choice for Speaker. The Prime Minister must show leadership on this issue and acknowledge that the member for Fisher was her choice of Speaker. It was a grave error of judgment. There were very serious and deep reservations held about the character of the member for Fisher before he was elevated to the position of Speaker. Indeed, the manager of opposition business moved that any number of Labor members be appointed to the position of Speaker. And yet every time that the manager of opposition business moved that another Labor member be appointed Speaker, indeed I'm reminded that he nominated nine Labor members to be Speaker, the government voted against it. On nine occasions, we tried to warn the government that this was a grave error of judgment to appoint the member for Fisher, but because he was part of the grubby political deal, the Prime Minister went ahead and damn the consequences. Sadly, the potential for the grubby political deal to drag down the reputation of the parliament has now been realised. The member for Fisher is still the Speaker, as, the Madam, as Madam Deputy Speaker well knows. He still commands the salary. He's still carrying on the business of Speaker behind the scenes. He just doesn't turn up for question time. And this is all part of the ruse to enable the government to say he stepped aside. He has not stepped aside. He is still the Speaker. He just doesn't turn up for the public viewing of question time. But in every other respect, he is the Speaker. Sadly, he is the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Now, yes, the member for Fisher has been embroiled in a court case, a sexual harassment case brought by one of his staffer. It is in the course of that case that this evidence has come to light, and this is uncontradicted evidence. The member for Fisher has not denied it. He has not claimed it was fake. It is entirely and absolutely uncontested evidence accepted by the court as evidence, as any the lawyer would Morton. know. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister struggles to admit fault or errors of judgment, and there have been plenty of errors of judgment on the part of the Prime Minister. I guess it's a matter of pride that she doesn't like to admit when she gets it wrong. But this is an issue that goes beyond the pride of the Prime Minister. This is an issue that goes to the heart of our democracy. Because if members of this parliament lose respect for the Speaker, it follows that the broader community will lose respect for the office of Speaker, and that will impact on the respect the community holds for the Australian parliament. Now, all members elected to this House know from their first days in this place of the important role of the Speaker of the Parliament. We are keenly aware of the need to accord the Speaker the highest levels of respect, obey the rulings of the Chair, and when we don't, the Speaker takes action and we oblige. The current Speaker, if he is retained in this role by the Prime Minister, will be an embarrassment not only to the members of this parliament, but to the Australian public as he carries on the duties of Speaker. Of course it's important to our democratic system to have a Speaker that upholds the dignity of the House. It underpins our system of government. But the Speaker also holds a very public role. He's the senior representative of the parliament in welcoming foreign leaders, foreign female leaders entertaining foreign dignitaries. And yes, they too read the media. They too will be aware of the views of the member for Fisher of women and the partial role he has played as Speaker in condemning a serving shadow minister in this House. He also leads delegations internationally. He is meant to be the person to lead our members of parliament overseas to represent the parliament, to lead female delegates. Does the Prime Minister think it's going to be easy for female delegates 
to go on trips overseas with the member for Fisher, knowing the views he holds about women, the sexist, misogynistic views that the member for Fisher holds about women. The Speaker also liaises with other governments, liaises with the Governor-General on our behalf, and as the Prime Minister often points out, not only do we have a female Prime Minister of this country, we have a female Governor-General. She's meant to receive the member for Fisher, the man who the Prime Minister chose to uphold the dignity of the House. The Speaker also leads the staff of the Parliament and is meant to set standards of behaviour for staff in the parliament, and we now know through this exchange of text messages how the speaker, the member for Fisher, deals with his staffers. Uncontested evidence of the most appalling kind. The speaker should be setting a personal example for others to follow. I remind the House of previous speakers who have set such an example. Speaker Harry Jenkins. Speaker Steve Martin, Speaker Neil Andrews, Speaker David Hawker, and there are many, many more from both sides of the House, speakers who have upheld the dignity of the House. Can you imagine any one of those occupants of the chair ever descending in the type of sexist, offensive, obscene conduct that is enshrined in these text messages that the member for Fisher sent to his staff? I call on all members to maintain the high standards to ensure that the Speaker is a person of dignity. It is a grave situation that only the Parliament can resolve by removing the Speaker from the office and electing a new Speaker. Has expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and I rise to oppose the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition. And in so doing, I say to the Leader of the Opposition, I will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny by this man. I will not. And the government Order. will not be lectured about sexism Order. and misogyny by this man. Not now, not ever. The Leader of the Opposition says that people who hold sexist views and who are misogynists are not appropriate for high office. Well, I hope the Leader of the Opposition has got a piece of paper and he is writing out his resignation. Because if he wants to know what misogyny looks like in modern Australia, he doesn't need a motion in the House of Representatives. He needs a mirror. That's what he needs. Let's go through the Opposition Leader's repulsive double standards Repulsive double North standards Sydney. when it comes to misogyny and sexism. We are now supposed to take seriously that the Leader of the Opposition is offended by Mr Slipper's text messages. When this is the Leader of the Opposition who has said, and this was when he was a minister under the last government, not when he was a student, not when he was in high school, when he was a minister under the last government. He has said, and I quote, in a discussion about uh, women being underrepresented in institutions of power in Australia, the interviewer was a man called Stavros. The Leader of the Opposition says, if it's true, Stavros, that men have more power, generally speaking, than women, is that a bad thing? <laughs> and then a discussion ensues and another person being interviewed says, I want my daughter to have as much opportunity as my son. To which the Leader of the Opposition says, yeah, I completely agree, but what if men are by physiology or temperament more adapted to exercise authority or to issue command? Then uh, ensues another discussion about women's role in modern society, and the uh, other person participating in the discussion says, I think it's very hard to deny that there is an underrepresentation of women, to which the Leader of the Opposition says, but now there's an assumption that this is a bad thing. This is the man from whom we're supposed to take lectures about sexism. And then, of course, it goes on. I was very offended personally 
when the Leader of the Opposition as Minister for Health said, and I quote, abortion is the easy way out. I was very personally offended by those comments. You said that in March 2004. I suggest you check the records. I was also very offended on behalf of the women of Australia when, in the course of uh, uh, this uh, carbon pricing campaign, the Leader of the Opposition said, when the housewives of Australia need to do what the housewives of Australia need to understand as they do the ironing. Thank you for that painting of women's roles in modern Australia. And then, of course, I was offended too by the sexism, by the misogyny of the Leader of the Opposition cat calling across this table at me as I sit here as Prime Minister. If the Prime Minister wants to, politically speaking, make an honest woman of herself, something that would never have been said to any man sitting in this chair, I was offended when the Leader of the Opposition went outside in the front of Parliament and stood next to a sign that said, Ditch the Witch. I was offended when the Leader of the Opposition stood next to a sign that described me as a man's bitch. I was offended by those things. Misogyny, sexism, every day from this Leader of the Opposition, every day in every way across the time the Leader of the Opposition has sat in that chair and I've sat in this chair. That is all we have heard from him. And now the Leader of the Opposition wants to be taken seriously. Apparently he's woken up after this track record and all of these statements. He's woken up and he's gone, oh dear, there's this thing called sexism. Oh my Lord, there's this thing called misogyny. Now who's one of them? Oh, the Speaker must be because that suits my political purpose doesn't turn a hair about any of his past statements, doesn't walk into this parliament and apologise to the women of Australia, doesn't walk into this parliament and apologise to me for the things that have come out of his mouth, but now seeks to use this as a battering ram against someone else. Well, this kind of hypocrisy should not be tolerated, which is why this motion from the Leader of the Opposition the should Patterson. not be taken seriously. Yeah. And then second, the Leader of the Opposition is always wonderful about walking into this parliament and giving me and others a lecture about what they should take responsibility for. Always wonderful about that, everything that I should take responsibility for, now apparently including uh, the text messages of the member for Fisher. Always keen to say others should assume responsibility, particularly me. Well, can anybody remind me of the Leader of the Opposition? has taken any responsibility for the conduct of the Sydney Young Liberals and the attendance at this event of members of his front bench? Has he taken any responsibility for the conduct of members of his political party and members of his front bench, who apparently, when the most vile things were being said about my family, raised no voice of objection? No one walked out of the room. No one walked up to Mr Jones and said that this was not acceptable. Instead, of course, it was all viewed as good fun until it was run in a Sunday newspaper and then the Leader of the Opposition and others started ducking for cover. Big on lectures of responsibility, very light on accepting responsibility himself for the vile conduct of members of his political party. Third, Ms Deputy Speaker, why the Leader of the Opposition should not be taken seriously on this motion. The Leader of the Opposition and the Deputy Leader of the Opposition have come into this place and have talked about the member for Fisher. Well, let me remind the Opposition and the Leader of the Opposition particularly about their track record and association with the member for Fisher. I remind them that the National Party pre-selected the member for Fisher for the 1984 election that the National Party pre-selected the member for Fisher for the 1987 election, that the Liberal Party pre-selected Mr Fisher for the 1993 election, then for the 96 election, then for the 98 election, then for the 2001 election, then for the 2004 election, then for the 2007 election and then for the 2010 election. And across many of those pre-selections, Mr Slipper enjoyed the personal support of the Leader of the Opposition. I remind the Leader of the Opposition 
that on the 28th of September 2010, following the last election campaign, when Mr Slipper was elected as Deputy Speaker, the Leader of the, the, opposition, Melbourne Ports. the Leader of the Opposition at that stage said this, and I quote, he referred to the member for Maranoa, who was also elected to a position at the same time, and then went on as follows. And the member for Fisher will serve as a fine compliment to the member for Scullin in the chair. I believe that the parliament will be well served by the team which will occupy the chair in this chamber. I congratulate the member for Fisher, who has been a friend of mine for a very long time, who has served this parliament in many capacities with distinction. The words of the Leader of the Opposition on record about his personal friendship with Mr Slipper and on record about his view about Mr Slipper's qualities and attributes to be the Speaker. No walking away from those words. They were the statement of the Leader of the Opposition then. I remind the Leader of the Opposition, who now comes in here and speaks about Mr Slipper and apparently his inability uh, to work with or talk to Mr Slipper, I remind the Leader of the Opposition he attended Mr Slipper's wedding. Did he walk up to Mr Slipper in the middle of the service and say he was disgusted to be there? Was that the attitude he took? No, he attended that wedding as a friend. The Leader of the Opposition keen to lecture others about what they ought to know or did know about Mr Slipper. Well, with respect, I'd say to the Leader of the Opposition, after a long personal association, including attending Mr Slipper's wedding, it would be interesting to know whether the Leader of the Opposition was surprised by these text messages. He's certainly in a position to speak more intimately about Mr Slipper than I am and many other people in this parliament, given this long personal association. Then of, course, uh, then, of course, the Leader of the Opposition uh, comes into this place and says, and I quote, and says, and I quote, every day the Prime Minister stands in this parliament to defend this speaker will be another day of shame for this parliament, another day of shame for a government which should already have died of shame. Well, where's that price? Well, can I indicate to the Leader of the Opposition the government is not dying of shame. My father did not die of shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What the Leader of the Opposition should be ashamed of yeah, is his yeah. performance in this parliament and the sexism he brings with it. Now, about the uh, text messages that are on the public record or reported uh, in the— uh, that's, a, that's a direct quote from the Leader of the Opposition, so I suggest those groaning have a word with him. Uh, now, on the uh, conduct of Mr Slipper and on the uh, text messages that are in the public domain. I have seen the press reports of those text messages. I am offended by their content. I am offended by their content because I am always offended by sexism. I am offended by their content because I am always offended by statements that are anti-women. I am offended by those things in the same way that I have been offended by things that the Leader of the Opposition has said, and no doubt uh, will continue to say in the future, because if this today was an exhibition of his new feminine side, well, I don't think we've got much to look forward to in terms of change conduct. I am offended by those text messages, but I also believe in terms of this parliament making a decision about the speakership that this parliament should recognise that there is a court case in progress, that the judge has reserved his decision, that having waited for a number of months for the legal matters surrounding Mr Slipper uh, to come to a conclusion, that this parliament should see that conclusion. I believe that is the appropriate path forward and that people will then have an opportunity to make up their minds with the fullest information available to them. But whenever people make up their minds about those questions, what I won't stand for, what I will never stand for, is the Leader of the Opposition coming into this place and peddling a double standard, 
peddling a standard for Mr Slipper he would not set for himself, peddling a standard for Mr Slipper he has not set for other members of his front bench, peddling a standard for Mr Slipper that has not been acquitted by the people who have been sent out to say the vilest and most revolting things like his former shadow parliamentary secretary, uh, secretary Senator Bernardi. I will not ever see the Leader of the Opposition seek to impose his double standard on this parliament. Yeah, yeah. Sexism should always be unacceptable. We should conduct ourselves as it is, should be always unacceptable. The Leader of the Opposition says do something. Well, he could do something himself if he wants to deal with sexism in this parliament. He could change his behaviour. He could apologise for all these past statements. He could apologise for standing next to signs describing me as a witch and a bitch, terminology that he's now objected to by the front bench of the opposition. He could change a standard himself if he sought to do so. But we will see none of that from the Leader of the Opposition, because on these questions he is incapable of change capable of double standards but incapable of change. His double standards should not rule this parliament. Good sense, common sense, proper process is what should rule this parliament. That's what I believe is the path forward for this parliament, not the kind of double standards and political game playing uh, imposed by the Leader of the Opposition. Now looking at his watch, because apparently a woman's spoken too long, I've had him yell at me to shut up in the past, but I will take the remaining, I will take the remaining seconds of my speaking time uh, to say to the Leader of the Opposition, I think the best course for him is to reflect on the standards he's exhibited in public life on the responsibility he should take for his public statements, on his close personal connection with Peter Slipper, on the hypocrisy he has displayed in this House today. And on that basis, because of the Leader of the Opposition's motivations, this parliament today should reject this motion and the Leader of the Opposition should think seriously about the role of women in public life and in Australian society, because we are entitled to a better standard than this. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the Leader of the Nationals. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy Speaker. Order. I take no joy whatever in speaking on a motion of this nature the Minister before for the families. I am deeply conscious of the gravity of this motion, how rare it has been in the history of this parliament for a motion to be put before debate that the Speaker be removed from his office. It is indeed a subject of, gr of great importance, of great significance, and it is a decision and it is an action taken by the opposition only with the deepest of heart. But these are circumstances that we have surely never before seen in this parliament. We have a speaker subject to a series of allegations over a long period of time, and we now find that some of those, uh, th those allegations are supported by the speaker's own words, text around the nation. This is unsatisfactory conduct from the person whose primary responsibility is to uphold the honour and the dignity of this parliament, to set an example to other members, to set an example to the community, to be the face of the parliament, a man that we should admire in the office. We should respect because he not only holds an important office, but because he carries out the responsibilities of that office with dignity. This is no mere censure of a speaker who's made a poor ruling as chairman of the, of the parliament. It's not a dispute over standing orders or administration of the parliament. It's, it's about the very fitness of the incumbent to hold this high office. There's been a dark cloud now that's been growing for far too long, and the government has been prepared to stand in the shadow rather than come out in the, to the light and condemn the behaviour of the man they chose to be speaker. They moved aside a man of great integrity, a person admired on all sides of the House, who had carried out his responsibility with distinction. There had been no suggestion of impropriety. 
There had been no succession that he had uh, he behaved in a way that was anything other than fair and appropriate for the, for the Speaker's office. He was stood aside and put in place a person who was trusted with the responsibility of the, of the traditions and, and the standards of the parliament who did not have such a record. Even at the very time that he was appointed to the Speaker, there had already been many months of articles in his own local newspapers questioning his integrity, questioning his use of his parliamentary entitlements, questioning his travel bills, questioning the quite strange travel patterns that have developed over the years. These questions were already in the public uh, era. They, are, they were already being considered and, and, and under investigation, and yet this government chose to make him the Speaker of this parliament. Now he still holds that office. He still holds that office. He collects the full salary. He continues to travel the world, entertain in his office uh, and, and, and collect the travel allowance. He's marked present for being here, even though uh, you, Madam Deputy Speaker, are conducting the most important part of his work. Now, this, 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 this office is more than just a privileged position. It's, it's more than pomp and ceremony and parades through the members' hall. The Speaker is the custodian of the dignity of this chamber, and it reflects on all who are seated here. The Speaker is the arbiter in whom the public must have confidence in, if they are to believe in the fair workings of this parliament. Now, despite political differences, the Speaker must be an impartial umpire over the people and the proceedings of the House. Now, from time to time, the Speaker rebukes members, and more on this side I must say than others, but re rebukes members because he does not believe that they have uh, appropriately recognised the standing orders. Now, if he's, un if he's to undertake that job, and to be respected in exercising that discipline, then he must earn that respect. He is not respected just because he holds an office entitled to respect. He must build on that reputation and earn that respect. And this speaker has not done that. How can you honour and, and, and accept rebuke from a person whose own behaviour falls so, so much short of the standards that we could reasonably speak? expect. The Speaker is the face of the parliament. He is the defender of the rights and the privileges of all members. It is a position of honour, but he needs also to bring honour to that post, and the member for Fisher has brought dishonour to the post. Further, he has made it absolutely clear through the, through the text which have now become, pub have become public that he does not believe that it is necessary for him to carry out his task with impartiality. And that is surely an absolutely essential ingredient of the person who should hold this office of Speaker. His comments about the suspension of the member for Indi are a disgrace. They are a disgrace to the office of the, of the Speaker. Of course, they are in inappropriate in their sexist nature, unacceptable in their sexist nature. But he also demonstrated that that decision was not made out of impartiality. It was made because he didn't like the member for Indi. He didn't like the member for Indi. He thought it was appropriate to suspend her on, on a day that was critical in the votes of this parliament, the day in which the carbon tax was to be inflicted upon the Australian people. He thought that was good fun to, to evict a member of the opposition in those circumstances. That does not reflect the level of impartiality that the members of this parliament have got a right to expect from the person who holds the high office of Speaker. It's a solemn trust which he, to, to which he is entrusted. It's a trust that speakers over the years, in the past, have assumed with reverence. There's a long tradition of honourable men and women who have filled this post. All of them have taken their responsibilities seriously. Most of them have built on the reputation and the, 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 and, and the standing of this parliament. But our current speaker has, deme has demeaned that office. He's declared himself innocent of the, the charges in relation to his private expenditure, although his defence has never been on show. The allegations of his, about his travel costs and cab charge still carry with them 
the odour of serious allegations that need to be responded. But in act of political expediency, this, go go uh, this government elevated the member for Fisher to this high office and in the, and in the process have plunged the parliament into a parlous state. Now, allegations of sexual harassment that have followed and they've engulfed the, the Speaker's office to the extent that the Speaker cannot fulfil his duties in the chamber. He's done the right thing by standing aside while these, while these allegations are, in, are under consideration. But they have become so much worse out of his own mouth, out of his own Twitter. They've become so much worse while he's been uh, absent from the chamber. And those allegations are so serious. They reflect so much on his attitude towards women and upon the parliament that he is not fit to hold this office. And, Madam Prime Minister, it is not a satisfactory defence of this person of the, who holds the office of Speaker to, to just indulge in a tirade of abuse against the Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition is not on trial here. It's the, dep it's the Speaker of this parliament that's on trial. The, 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 opposition may, the government may well have, over recent weeks, tried to distract attention from their carbon tax, from their, from their $120 billion black hole, from the crises after crises of bad management in government by trying to, 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 to slur the Leader of the Opposition. Now, that is an unsatisfactory behaviour, and the people of Australia can make their own judgments about that. But, with, but what the Prime Minister should have done today if she, that, that she should have defended and given us a reason as a parliament to have confidence in this speaker. She should have given us a reason in her speech as to why we should not seek to have the speaker removed. She did not choose to do that. She spent her time criticising the Leader of the Opposition. She spent her time criticising other people and comments they may have made about her. But she did not address the, the crisis of confidence that there is in this place in the speaker. In the speaker. A man who, uh, whom the government has recently uh, uh, been involved in a payout of $50,000 worth of taxpayers' dollars, that suggests that these are more than just allegations against the Speaker. Uh, the, the government itself was prepared to pay out $50,000 to settle just one of these actions, along with three quarters of a million dollars worth of legal expenses and who knows what else. So these are not, this is not just idle chatter. These are not just the empty words of the man who occupies the, the Speaker's uh, chair, no matter how inappropriate, no matter how sexist, no matter how repugnant those words are to everybody in the chamber, these are actually words now that have had the credibility of court action and some degree of judgment. And in reality, in these circumstances, the Speaker is left exposed. The Speaker has no defence. The Speaker is bringing disrepute upon this parliament and therefore he lacks the public confidence that the institutions uh, of, of, this, of this government, of our democracy, are entitled to, to, uh, to enjoy. Madam Deputy Speaker, the revelations of the abhorrent text messages have really broken the camel's back. They have shattered public confidence and left this government with no option, with no option but to sack the speakers. The, comment, uh, on the, the contents of the messages are certainly vile. They are denigrating to women and even include reference to female members of this chamber. Now, none of that is acceptable behaviour from the person who is supposed to be the custodian of the honour of this parliament. None of that is acceptable from a person that we, are, we, we, that we should be respecting in the office of speaker. Now, the facts are that, that, that in, in truth, the poisoned texts of the speaker say it all to everyone. The duplicity of the government is laid bare for all to see because of their defence of this, of this speaker. But the Prime Minister, sh who showed poor political judgment to, for him to, be, to, to, to support his uh, selection in the first place, but now she can still gain some honour. She can still gain some honour for this, for this shameful incident. She could still do the right thing. She could still do the right thing. Admit the error of judgment and support the motion that the, that, that the, parliament, that the, that the, that the parliament has no longer got confidence in this man and they want to have a new speaker. Now, the Prime Minister criticises the Leader of the Opposition, but this is about the future of the Speaker. The Speaker must have the confidence of the House. This Speaker does not have the confidence of the Australian people. His behaviour 
does not befit a person in this important position. I call on the Prime Minister to end the torment of the Australian people. We've had enough. Restore trust to this office. It's time to stand up for decency and integrity and the honour of the parliament. It's essential that we have a new speaker to help restore the dignity of this House and the confidence of the Australian people. The Cabinet Secretary has the call. Mr. Speaker, and what a shameful day this is. What a shameful day this is. Those opposite should be hanging their heads in shame at what they are seeking to do here. Deputy Speaker, plucking, plucking a piece of evidence from an ongoing case in the Federal Court of Australia, plucking that piece of evidence and bringing it here, seeking a rush to judgment a rush to judgment before the federal court has even ruled on the abuse of process application that this piece of evidence was tendered in, seeking to rush to judgment, let alone before the actual case, the case brought by Mr Ashby in the Federal Court of Australia, is ruled upon. Because there are two stages in this case in the federal court, and where the judge is at at the moment, just to remind members opposite, is that he's heard an abuse of process application which says that the whole case brought by Mr Ashby should be thrown out of court. And the judge is presently considering his decision in respect of that application. He reserved last week. And in the course of that application for abuse of process, uh, the judge made some highly critical remarks about the conduct of this case. But those opposite would have us rush to judgment on the Speaker of this chamber before the judge in the federal court has ruled on abuse of process, before the judge in the federal court has ruled on the actual case brought by Mr Ashby, and before, I might say, anyone in this parliament has had the chance to examine anything about these texts, anything about the context in which they were tendered in the Federal Court of Australia in evidence. And it might be said this, and I picked this up from reading the newspaper accounts about these texts, that the text, the particular text in question, and it is a sexist and offensive text, so I don't make any bones about this, the particular text in question was an exchange that, Mr, that the Speaker of the House of Representatives had with Mr James Ashby before the member for Fisher became Speaker of the House of Representatives and before, I might add, he became, Mr Ashby became his employee. And you can see, indeed, when he was a Liberal National Party member of this place, and as the Prime Minister has said, a Liberal National Party member of this place pre-selected on no less than eight occasions, first by the National Party in, for the 1984 election, then by the Liberal Party of Australia, and more latterly at the last four or five or six times he was pre-selected by the Liberal National Party of Queensland. Um, we hear from the Leader of the Opposition uh, falsely, it seems, saying we were trying to get him out of our party room. Well, they were pretty slow about it, Deputy Speaker. They've taken since 1984 to get the member for Fisher out of their party room, and uh, they weren't exactly hurrying at the 2010 election either. At the 2010 election, this Leader of the Opposition, Deputy Speaker, stood side by side with the member for Fisher and endorsed him for election as member for Fisher, and to have the Leader of the Opposition come in here, not only inviting this House to act as a kangaroo court, which we should resoundingly reject, not only inviting this House to rush to judgment on the Speaker of our chamber on the most thinnest piece of evidence plucked from the Federal Court of Australia, uh, we have the Leader of the Opposition seeking to comment, if you please, on the merits of the case before the court, saying of Mr James Ashby, his only fault, and I'm quoting directly from the Leader of the Opposition, his only fault was seeking to assert his rights against the Speaker of this Parliament. Well, the Leader of the Opposition should actually have a look at what Mr James Ashby did and might care to listen to the comments that Justice Rarys in the Federal Court of Australia made last week. There were extreme criticisms expressed of Mr James Ashby by this judge in the federal court, in particular criticism of the way in which Mr Ashby chose to bring his case 
against the Speaker of the House of Representatives, chose to uh, make allegations of criminality which were given the most extreme publicity possible, only then to have them withdrawn. The judge commented as well on the publicity that Mr Ashby had sought to bring to every aspect of this case. And yet this opposition seeks, and I'll come back to this, Deputy Speaker, to attack the Attorney General for doing her job, which is to explain the way in which proceedings involving the Commonwealth are being conducted, because the people of Australia are perfectly entitled to be informed about the way proceedings are being conducted. Deputy Speaker, no institution is safe from this opposition. No convention is safe from this opposition. Not the courts and certainly not this parliament is safe from this opposition. It's an opposition that does not believe in due process. It's an opposition that does not believe in fairness. It's an opposition that has no shame, is prepared to tear down any institution, tear down any convention to get at their objective, which is power for this leader of the opposition. This is a leader of the opposition who will let no institution, no convention stand in his way. We've heard of that from the member from New England. No trick is too low, no stunt is too wild, and no effort will be spared to create an atmosphere of disorder in this chamber when none exists. The leader of the opposition should in fact be explaining to this chamber what the involvement of Mal Bruff, a former member of this chamber, was in the bringing of this case in the federal court. The Leader of the Opposition could well explain the involvement of the member for Sturt in the planning of the attack on the Speaker of our chamber. Or indeed, let's hear from the Leader of the Opposition about the involvement of Mark McArdle, a minister, a Liberal National Party minister in the government in Queensland, who was also, we have learned from proceedings in the Federal Court of Australia, directly involved in the planning of this attack, using court proceedings in the planning of this attack on the Speaker of the House of Representatives. I said a moment ago, Deputy Speaker, that there is a misguided attack being made in the course of these speeches that we've heard from the opposition this afternoon. There is a misguided attack being made on the Attorney General for comments that she has made in the course of this proceeding in the federal court about the way in which the case has been conducted. And I say, and we should all uh, say loud and clear, Deputy Speaker, that the comments made by the Attorney General have been entirely appropriate. This has been, as the judge has commented himself, a very, very unusual case. And because it is such an unusual case, when the Commonwealth brings an application for the proceeding to be struck out as an abusive process, that's a pretty unusual application. And it's entirely appropriate for the Attorney General to say, yes, the Commonwealth's view is that this case is an abusive process. This is the basis for the application we make to the court. This is the reason we have engaged lawyers to put that application to the court, and these are the details of it. It is entirely appropriate for the Attorney General to explain the basis on which the, Commonwealth's, the claim against the Commonwealth was settled. And as for the nonsensical statements that we continue to hear from those opposite about the expenditure of $50,000 in settling the case, as any uh, legal practitioner, and there are a few on the other side uh, who would know this, would know it is entirely appropriate to compromise proceedings. Compromise of proceedings, settlement of disputes, is what the legal system exists for. Not to magnify disputes, not to exaggerate claims, which is what those opposite would always wish to do. No, the objective of the legal system, the purpose of the legal system, is to bring disputes to an end in an orderly way. It is always potentially entirely appropriate for any litigant, including the Commonwealth of Australia, to settle claims brought against that litigant and to do so if it avoids further cost and further difficulty and further trouble to the litigant to do so. The, it's become very clear, Deputy Speaker, that there is no respect for the office of the Speaker of this House from anybody in the Liberal Party, anybody in the National Party or anybody in the Liberal National Party of Queensland. None, Deputy Speaker. It's become clear in the course of the proceeding, which the Leader of the Opposition now seeks to take advantage of, 
It's become clear in the course of this court hearing last week that James Ashby did not complain to the Speaker about his conduct at any time before bringing the complaint in the federal court. Mr Ashby did not complain, and I'm now simply uh, and in case— no, I'm not talking about the evidence. Order. And, it, I, and I'm just going to make clear the Order. basis on which, Deputy Speaker, I am going to make it clear the basis on which I'm making these comments to those opposite who seek to abuse court proceedings. I do not. I seek merely to repeat for the assistance of members of this House what has happened in this proceeding and what happened in this proceeding last week in the course of the abuse of process application that the judge heard was that the judge questioned counsel for Mr Ashby as to when he had made a complaint. He questioned counsel for Mr Ashby as to whether or not it was possible for this claim to have been brought in some other way, and no answer was provided because it's the fact that Mr James Ashby did not complain to his managers. He did not complain to human relations officers in this place. He did not complain to the Department of Parliamentary Services. He did not use the processes provided by the Human Rights Commission. This is not the evidence. This is the actual contentions advanced in court last week. And the judge made it clear, because this is one of the bases of the abuse of process application put to the court, that Mr Ashby did not use the processes provided for claims of this nature by the Human Rights Commission, which involve confidential communication. Far from it, Deputy Speaker, assisted by operatives from the Liberal National Party, assisted by those associated with the opposition, it would appear potentially assisted by the member for Sturt, Mr James Ashby brought this claim in the most public way to cause maximum embarrassment to the Speaker of the House of Representatives. And I repeat, Deputy Speaker, I am not seeking to comment on the merits of the claim brought by Mr. Ashby. I am commenting on the way. I am commenting on the way that this opposition, without shame, seeks to abuse the processes of the federal court, seeks to have this parliament sit as a kangaroo court, without giving any notice, without giving any proper opportunity for examination of this. What I am commenting on, Deputy Speaker, is the way that this opposition has sat silent during the attacks on the Speaker of the House of Representatives, has sat silent while the processes of the federal court were used in the way that they have been to cause maximum embarrassment to the Speaker of the House of Representatives, because nobody Nobody who is in the slightest bit interested in politics in Australia could have failed to notice that what we have had this year is trial by media, where those opposite wish simply to cause trouble to the Speaker of the House of Representatives, to cause embarrassment to the Speaker of the House of Representatives. They do not wish to wait, Deputy Speaker, until the federal court rules on any question at all. They don't wish to wait until the Federal Court of Australia has ruled on the abuse of process application. They don't wish to wait until the Federal Court of Australia has ruled, let alone on the actual merits of the claim brought by James Ashby. No, they would wish to leap in. They would, they would wish to fan the flames of public embarrassment and the trial by media that we have had in this country since the 20th of April, when the Speaker of the House of Representatives was bailed up, Deputy Speaker, by a phalanx of television cameras without any notice to him, without, before even the proceedings in the court had been served on him, he was met at the airport by the barrage of television cameras and journalists. This opposition sits silent. They have no regard for due process. They have no decency. They have no respect for institutions or conventions. And if they had any decency, Deputy Speaker, they would not have rushed so assiduously to assist James Ashby in his attack on the Speaker of the House of Representatives. They would not have rushed to help him drag down the Speaker of this House. They would have thought of other ways of resolving this complaint. They would have thought of the other ways that are provided by the legal system for resolving complaints of this nature. They would have thought of other ways that are provided by human relations procedures, both in this parliament, in the Department of Parliamentary Services and by the Human Rights Commission. But no, but no. Seizing on whatever pretext 
Deputy Speaker, they come to this parliament. They invite this parliament without notice, without examination of the material, to sit here as a kangaroo court to rush to judgment, which, which was the way in which I commenced this speech. It is extraordinary hypocrisy from this Leader of the Opposition, Deputy Speaker, who has spent a lifetime making offensive comments about women, has spent a lifetime making sexist comments, starting way back in his student days when he thought it amusing to refer to the chair of the Students' Representative Council at the Sydney University as chair thing. Ra thing. Let's think about that. That's this Leader of the Opposition, and in almost every year of his life since, Deputy Speaker, he has been making offensive the comments time about women. Has expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the Manager of Opposition Business. Here, here. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker. And Madam Deputy Speaker, I don't uh, come to this debate uh, with any sense of pleasure at all. I come to this debate to this debate with a great sense of a heavy heart. Uh, I have known the Speaker for the best part of 20 years, and when you get to serve as a colleague with another human being for 20 years, uh, you have many shared experiences over that time in both opposition, government and opposition again. And I am very sad and very sorry that we have come to this pass in this place. And I know that other members of this House know exactly what I mean. Because all of this could have been entirely predicted when the Prime Minister suspended yet again her best judgment to choose her own political survival over good judgment made in this place as Prime Minister. We don't seek, Madam Deputy Speaker, to prejudge the court case that is currently underway in the federal court. The reason the opposition brings this motion to the House today, a very serious motion to declare the speakership vacant, is because the revelations that have arisen out of the court case are so heinous, so egregious, that it is the opposition's contention that the speaker can never resume the chair in this place in any way that would lend confidence to the opposition that he would do so with impartiality, good taste and fairness. The Prime Minister said in her defence of the Speaker today, when she associated herself with the member for Fisher, she said there was a double standard being employed by this opposition. But I remind the House, Madam Deputy Speaker, that it was this Prime Minister who said in relation to the member for Dobell that a line has been crossed and that that line meant that he could no longer serve in the Labor caucus. But in spite of the revelations about the current speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, in spite of everything we now know about the speaker, the Prime Minister still does not believe that any line has been crossed. Because at the end of the day, Madam Deputy Speaker, this Prime Minister always puts her own political survival her own ruthless ambition ahead of the best interests of the Australian people and this parliament as their representatives. She's always done it in her career, Madam Deputy Speaker. She did it to Kevin Rudd, the member for Griffith, when she promised she would never seek the prime ministership and then ruthlessly cut him down in the dark of the night to seize the job before the 2010 election. She did it when she told the Australian people that there be no carbon tax under the government I lead, and then to get the Greens into the tent after the election, broke that promise ruthlessly so that she could cling to power in this parliament. She's never had any regard for anything other than her own ruthless ambition and desire to grasp power in this country since her university days when she was part of the far left of the Australian Union of Students, Madam Deputy Speaker. And let's deal with some of the things the Prime Minister said in her speech. She did not at any point rise to defend the Speaker, the member for Fisher, about the allegations that have been made against him and about the release of the egregious text messages. No. She played the victim, Madam Deputy Speaker. She attacked someone else. She said any debate about these matters was pure sexism on the part of the opposition. 
She played the victim in an insipid and pathetic performance that was unprime ministerial. But nobody forced the Prime Minister's hand in November 2011. Nobody came to her and said, you must axe Harry Jenkins, the member for Scullin, and put in Peter Slipper. She came up with that idea all on her own. She came up with the idea of gaining one extra vote in this chamber. She never at any point, Madam Deputy Speaker, was forced to crash her prime ministership on the rocks of her own self-regard, on the rocks of her own ruthless ambition to seize and hold power. Her judgment is in question today. The Prime Minister's judgment is in question today because time and time again this government lurches from one catastrophe to another, from one scandal to another, whether it is the member for Dobell, whether it is the pink bats fiasco, whether it is the school halls disaster, whether it is the super troll of mind changing, the live exports fiasco, the carbon tax breach of promise. The public deserve so much better in this country, Madam Deputy Speaker. The public deserve a government that puts their interests first rather than their own interests. And I beseech the, the, some good members of the Labor caucus, and I'm looking at them now, to recognise that the damage that's been done to this parliament in the last 12 months has damaged us all. The lack of integrity that has been demonstrated by this Prime Minister in choosing one vote over principle has damaged the parliament and our Westminster tradition. And I'm reminded, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm reminded of that scene from A Man for All Seasons, when St Thomas More says to Richard Rich, for Wales, why, Richard, it profits a man nothing to give his soul for the whole world, but for Wales. And yet this Prime Minister born of Wales, this Prime Minister born of Wales sacrificed her soul for just one vote. And the whole Labor caucus owns it. The whole Labor caucus owns it. All the sanctimonious, supercilious members of the Labor front bench who come out and do press conferences day after day lecturing the opposition and the Australian people about misogyny are going to vote today to support the member for Fisher remaining in the role of Speaker. Like lemmings going over the cliff, the Labor caucus is yet again going to follow this perfidious Prime Minister over the cliff to protect her own ambition, her own ruthless desire to grab and cling to power. And surely it's time the members of the Labor caucus started putting the Australian people first and this Prime Minister last, because that is what is going to happen. Let's talk about the Prime Minister's double standard, Madam Deputy Speaker. She lectures us, she lectures the Leader of the Opposition about his past statements. When the former member for Robertson said of the member for Indi that evil thoughts will turn your baby into a demon, the only comment from the then Deputy Prime Minister was, the member for Robertson is a good member. The member for Robertson is a good member. She throws our words back at us today, but let's remember her words. The member for Robertson is a good member. A person who said that the member for Indi, her, the evil thoughts would turn her baby into a demon. And it doesn't stop there. When John Williams was the Labor candidate for Indi in 2004, he said that the member for Indi could not represent the people of Indi because she didn't have any children, because she didn't have a family. She wasn't married and didn't have any children. She said she couldn't possibly, he said she couldn't possibly represent the, the, the constituents of Indi. Sound familiar? And do you know what happened? Julia Gillard did not. She did not come out and attack those appalling statements. No. After it had been reported in the age, she went and campaigned for the Labor candidate for Indi, Mr Williams. She went and supported the John Williams, the candidate for Indi. She says to us, the Prime Minister says to us that we fostered and supported the member for Fisher as the candidate for all those years. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, we did not support him to be put in the most important position in this parliament. We did not support him 
to be Deputy Speaker after the 2010 election. We opposed his election in 2010 to the post of Deputy Speaker, and the Labor Party supported him. And in 2011, we opposed his election as Speaker of the House, and I nominated on that occasion nine different members of the Labor Party who I said didn't they believe they had the integrity to take the chair. I nominated them to take the chair. And their responses were very interesting because you yourself, Madam Deputy Speaker, you yourself, Madam Deputy Speaker, said that, uh, in fact, while you, while you with a heavy a heart, minute, <laughs> you turned down. While I was loath to do so, in fact, you said I turned down the offer. And the member for Reid, he was good enough to be uncomfortable about the fact that he had to turn down the nomination because it wasn't just this side of the house that knew that the Labor Party was crowing for no good reason. Many members of the Labor caucus knew that the Prime Minister's judgment was seriously flawed on that occasion, but it was catastrophically flawed today in standing up and defending the member for Fisher remaining in this post and, worse, driving her caucus over the cliff with them. Madam Deputy Speaker, since the current Speaker I'll, I'll has been call elected— you up, <laughs> Mr. Dep Act Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, you, since this Speaker has been elected, he has sat in the chair for 19 days in question time, and he has not sat in the chair for 34 days. For 34 days, the current speaker has been the speaker with the full salary and emoluments, the capacity for overseas travel, the higher travelling allowance, every other um, uh, emolument that comes with the role of speaker, meeting foreign dignitaries, greeting them at the chamber door, etc. He's been doing that, but for 34 days he has not sat in question time while the member for Chisholm has fulfilled that role, and for only 19 days he has sat in the chair as Speaker since his election on November 24, 2011. This has become high farce. This is beyond a joke. The member for Denison, in fact, described it as beyond a joke, and he is correct. The public expect a great deal better from this 43rd parliament. And if today the House votes to make the Speaker's chair vacant, this will be the first opportunity, the first occasion. There have been many opportunities, but it will be the first occasion that the parliament has finally stood up for its own integrity and supported itself. Madam Deputy Speaker, we also heard from the member for Isaacs. It was an extraordinary performance. But his credibility on these matters is nil. This is a man. He represents the seat of Isaacs, the first Jewish governor general in Australia's history, the first Australian-born governor general in Australia's history. He himself is of the Jewish faith, and yet he described the leader of the opposition as using Goebbels-like tactics. This is a man who it's alleged and was reported in the newspapers called the member for Indi a bitch in this chamber and was forced to come back into the chamber, apologise and withdraw. And yet he stands in this House today and lectures, lectures the opposition on our statements that we've made in the past. The hypocrisy of the member for Isaacs is breathtaking. He said that the text messages exchanged between the uh, applicant in the case in the federal court and one of the respondents uh, all happened before uh, the member for Fisher was the speaker. Quite frankly, so what? The behaviour since he was speaker is the matter that's complained about by the applicant in the case. And he was the deputy speaker. And I remind you, the Labor Party appointed him to that role and appointed him to the speakership. The member for Isaac said that the, the opposition had no respect for the office of speaker. We are in the House this afternoon debating this motion to make the Speaker's seat vacant because we are the side of the House that has respect for the office of Speaker. We would never have traduced it, never have traduced it by axing a fine and honourable man in the member for Scullin in order to gain one vote on the floor of the House. And like Banquo's ghost, that decision of this Prime Minister has come back to haunt her and it hangs around her neck like a millstone right through to the next election, another example of her bad judgment. So I do commend 
this motion to the House. And I call on those good members of the Labor caucus who are thoroughly sick of this Prime Minister to finally show the courage that you have and support the opposition in restoring integrity to this parliament, in restoring integrity to the jobs that we do as members of this parliament. And I call on the House to support the resolution. Yeah. Order. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Banks. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's appropriate that as the member who nominated the member for Fisher firstly as Deputy Speaker to this House and then as Speaker to this House that I contribute to this debate. I accept that. And I've gone back over the words that I used both when I nominated the member for Fisher as Deputy Speaker and then as Speaker, and I don't resile from anything that I said then. Indeed, the member for Fisher was so successful in his job at question time that for the first time in over 20 years he managed to silence me for fear of being thrown out of the parliament, because that's never happened to me in 22 and a half years. But this debate before the House is a very serious debate today because there are precedents that will be forged as a result of it and it's got to be taken seriously. This isn't student politics, which is where I first observed the Leader of the Opposition, as with the member for Oringa at Sydney University. This is the real show, the alternative government, the alternative Prime Minister. So student politics stunts aren't enough to remove a Speaker, to cripple a House, because people are upset that they're not on this side of the House. Let's have a look at the issues. Let's have a look at the principles. I was trained as a lawyer, a criminal defence lawyer. So cases I did involved people going to jail if they were found guilty. That was the penalty. The Leader of the Opposition knows about being in court and having false accusations made against you and what that can do and allowing a process to go the full length. Now, in relation to the, the Speaker, there are no criminal charges that we know of. There's an investigation into cab charge documents, allegations that were withdrawn by the civil complainant, Mr Ashby, and weren't pursued. So that's not before us. There's not a scintilla of evidence that there's any evidence of abuse of cab charge documents. The criminal one, you know, a criminal charge, not a civil charge, the more serious of both. I say to the members of the opposition, where's the evidence? of criminal involvement of the Speaker. There is none. And indeed, the presiding judge in the federal court made a number of statements last week which brought into question the filing of that, of that affidavit in court in those terms and its subsequent withdrawal. So what we're dealing with is a civil charge where the Speaker is contesting it as an abusive process and the judge is reserved. And the opposition want us to come in and adjudicate. And I say to the crossbenchers, because I think they're the ones who will determine this debate, a very dangerous precedent. And the member for New England has previously said and cited the case of Nick Greiner, who was found by ICAC to be corrupt and he was dumped as Premier, but subsequently a court of appeal acquitted him and found that ICAC had got it wrong. Now, we are not in this instance, in the first instance, we should be waiting for the real court, not the kangaroo court. And the thing that's most disturbing is the other procedures, because I used to be on the Privileges Committee. I've been on the Procedures Committee. I understand some of the history of this case. And I remember the case of Fitzpatrick and Brown, who this parliament put in jail for three months in 1955. At least Fitzpatrick and Brown addressed the bar of the House. Where's the procedural fairness in this shonky motion? A speaker who's absent, who doesn't have the opportunity to have someone address on his behalf, who has a situation where the numbers are depleted because what he has voluntarily done is not take his place in the House, which was his decision alone. So he doesn't come in and vote. He doesn't come in and participate in relation to, to debate. He doesn't preside in any way. What's the urgency of this? 
Now, I'm not here to endorse text messages that were private text messages that a judge of the federal court will adjudicate on as to what they constitute. I say, what if it was me? How would I want it adjudicated? Is this the way we're going to administer justice? Hang, draw and quarter someone, not because we're impartial. Let's be very clear. The vote will be a partisan vote as far as the opposition is concerned. And as far as the government is concerned, it's not on independent grounds. We don't know what the Speaker's answer to some of these allegations are, but we get a smug, not we're going to put this on the table, we're going to give an opportunity for this matter to be considered and then be dealt with later on. It gets brought on for debate. Now, this is a very dangerous precedent. And I can understand some members having particular concerns. But this isn't about Mr Slipper. This is about principles. Once you move away from certain principles, and you know, I am I'm not going to sit here and try and say I am better than you or whatever. My record speaks for itself. I've been in this place for 22 and a half years. The Privileges Committee, of which I've been a member, of which I've seen them operate, operates impeccably. All sides of the parliament has always operated unanimously because these are grave issues. But we are not prepared to give the Speaker of this House an opportunity to present a case, to have a case pleaded on his behalf, and he's going to be one vote down. Where's the pair for his, for if he sat in the chamber in terms of the government as one vote down? These are things that need to be thought of. Why do I say it? Gee whiz. I remember 1975 and the appointment of replacement senators, and we changed the constitution. Now, the point I'm trying to make to you is, and I like the whingers and whiners, get up and put your point of view. The Leader of the Opposition verbaled me, which is why I wanted to speak. He tried to misrepresent my position when today I announced I was resigning as chair of caucus with this position. That's why I'm speaking. I asked to speak, and I was never going to be stopped from speaking. So if you want to get up and speak, get up and speak inside your four speeches. But what I'm telling you is a situation that will govern this parliament in future. The decision we make, if we make the wrong decision, we will be bound by it and the principle of it. I can understand rough and tough politics, but my plea to the Leader of Opposition is you're not at Sydney University now. You're, you're, you're the alternative Prime Minister. There's some places you don't go to. There's some places you show a bit of patience and allow people to flow with. I find it resentful that the member for Sturt attacks the Speaker for the 34 days he hasn't presided, when, frankly, that was the Speaker's offering to remove his position from criticism at the time. Now, we've got a situation where a judgment is reserved. So it's not a question of sub -judice. I am not arguing sub -judice per se. I am arguing a separation of powers, a civil matter, where this parliament is entitled as a matter of course to have the judge's determination in front of it before it makes a decision in relation to the speaker. And any bozo can see that except a lynch mob who have a political purpose. And I'm not trying to say that in a derogatory sort of way. I can understand people wanting to get swept up in it. But that's, all, that's how it is. Call it as it is. What I'm saying to you is, and I'm saying it as the person who nominated Mr Slipper, the member for Fisher, for this office. And I, I don't say that the parliament doesn't have a right to remove him. That is not my argument. I am saying to you, before you proceed down that path, let the cards fall where they're going to fall in the federal court. It may well be that the federal court gives you the ammunition for him to go voluntarily without being voted out by the House. I believe that that option adds further dignity to the House. But this is not dignified. To pull on a motion without notice where the Speaker's support is one vote down because he's not in the chair, it is not a true representation of this parliament. And so, you know, be very careful, be very cautious, because I, for one, didn't like 
what the parliament then did back in 1955 and sent people to jail for three months. But I'll tell you what they did have, which we don't have. They had a conscience vote, not a vote on party lines to remove a speaker. And I'm not arguing for a conscience vote. I'm not arguing for it, but I'm, 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 I'm re-emphasising a point I made to you earlier that we are involved in a party political debate which has ramifications for how this parliament is seen by those outside and by parliaments around the world. So I say to the independents, you've got an you, you will have an opportunity in the near future, I assume, to exercise your judgment if you have doubts. But today is not the day, and I say that in all sincerity. In all sincerity, because the position is we have to get this right. We can't act hastily and get it wrong. What happens if we make the decision and we remove the speaker today and the federal court judge finds that it, you know that well I'll tell you something about text messages, brother. I'll show mine to the world. I don't think 226 MPs would and survive. This wasn't a public communication. This was a private communication that came out as a result of subpoenas. And you know, the difficulty here is that we each need to be very careful. I know we can engage in, in the theatre of a debate, but this actually has quite serious ramifications. And I believe I've raised some fundamental issues that, that show that this procedure today and proceeding to a vote is flawed. And don't be too smart by half. These principles are bigger than slipper. They're bigger than anyone in this chamber. We have a duty to maintain the dignity of this chamber. And I don't believe the dignity of this chamber would be removed, would be, would be maintained if we removed the speaker without him having an opportunity to present a case to us, without a full complement of the House, without, without the wisdom of, of the federal court's judgment in relation to the matter that is currently before him. So to me, um, I say don't, don't persist with this at this point of time. Leave it on the table, allow it to stand there. We revisit it when his honour delivers his judgment in the federal court case. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the Leader of the House. I thank you, Deputy Speaker. Today is the day when the Liberal Party have discovered misogyny. Before today, it didn't exist. Before today, indeed, on the nine separate occasions in which the Liberal or National parties pre-selected Peter Slipper, they didn't know anything about him. Today is the day where, in spite of the fact that we have a court case, a court case where the judge has reserved judgment just last Friday, they come in here into this parliament today and move this resolution. This resolution, which would be the first time that such a resolution had ever been carried on partisan lines, and they do so without any concern whatsoever for the consequences, for the standing of this parliament, for the precedences that are set. And what we have seen, though, is some consistency from those opposite, because we saw with their attitude over the issues resolving the member for Dobell, over the issues resolving the member for Fisher, when it is convenient, when it is convenient, they say no one should comment on these because they're before the courts. Remember that. Yeah, right. Remember them out there. The member for Sturt, the Leader of the Opposition and others, critical of myself for making some comments. And yet here, here they are once again setting up this parliament, this parliament to usurp the role. The fact is this. These issues, these issues are of concern. I raise the issue of uh, the comments I was asked. Uh, Am I concerned about the comments by uh, the member for Fisher? And I state unequivocally, yes. I am concerned about sexism 
in any form. In any form. But that didn't seem to matter as a precondition for holding high office for the Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition has made statements in that interview in the Good Weekend magazine of, uh, of a debate with Michael Costa where he stated, but what if men are by physiology or temperament more adapted to exercise authority or to issue command? When Michael Costa spoke about the need to deal with the underrepresentation of women, he said, but now there's an assumption that this is a bad thing. He said abortion is the easy way out when it comes to uh, the difficult choices that women and only women should have a right to determine. He's made all sorts of statements over not just a year, not just a term, but over decades in public life. And we saw, of course, the historical linkage between the Sydney Uni Liberal Club with the speech from Alan Jones and his political origins. His political origins at Sydney University, where he engaged in the sort of campaign that has characterised the hard right on Sydney University right throughout the years from the 70s through to the current day. Through to the current day. He couldn't actually, couldn't drag himself to condemn Alan Jones for saying that this Prime Minister should be put in a chaff bag and dragged out to sea. Indeed, he rang up Alan Jones this week to console him and had a private conversation with him. He couldn't bring himself on Sunday morning, where the alternative leader of the opposition, who's got more leadership in his little finger than this bloke, was straight out there on the Sunday morning to condemn the comments relating to the Prime Minister's father, couldn't bring himself, had to wait for Alan to do the press conference because he didn't want to upset Alan, was more important than doing the right thing and showing just a smidgen of leadership, just a little bit, just once. But what we've seen since 2010, and today is the logical extension of it, is the longest dummy spit in Australian political history. We saw, we saw during those 17 days statements from this Leader of the Opposition that he would dignify the parliament, he would respect whatever decision the crossbenchers have made. Indeed, we had parliamentary reform that would have made, that would have made who the Speaker was irrelevant in terms of the partisanship of this chamber. Agreed to, not under coercion, agreed to voluntarily by those opposite and signed up to by the manager of opposition business and this leader of the opposition, as well as the Prime Minister and myself and the crossbenchers. Signed up to, to take away partisanship from the speakership of this parliament. And yet, and yet, straight away, when he couldn't get his way, like the kid who doesn't get to bat first, going in and trashing all the stumps, <laughs> he, he comes in and from that day on trashes parliamentary process, right. comes in here again and trashes question time as he does day after day, engages in the sort of political debate and strategy based upon wrecking the joint, wrecking the joint or destroying the joint as his mate Alan Jones would say. But this bloke, this bloke does it day in and day out. His whole political strategy has been to wreck the parliament. That's right. He has boasted about wrecking the parliament, and he has tried to do it on issue after issue. That's why more than 400 bills have passed this parliament without a single defeat. Those opposite are the first opposition in history to not worry about the actual policy that's going through the parliament and the key policy debates of the day. And that might be acceptable if they were a rump. But they, they, are, they are not quite half the parliament. And in spite of the fact they're in a position 
with getting support from the crossbenchers to make a difference to the way this nation operates in policy terms, they haven't won a thing. And why? Why? Because they don't care. Because it's all about political power for power's sake. And we saw it from the Leader of the Opposition when he spoke about how difficult it was to be in opposition. Remember he said, remember he said, it's not quite like losing a spouse, it's like losing a parent. That's what he had to say. He then went on to say, of course, the tragedy of losing some of his salary. He then went on to show just how out of touch he is. But we see it absolutely day in and day out. But you'd think that the manager of opposition business and the leader of the opposition and others who've spoken in this debate hadn't met Peter Slipper, the member for Fisher. Well, I table the reference from Tony Abbott, Liberal pre-selectors for the electorate of Fisher. The fact that Peter has sh chosen to stand in Fisher, even though much of his ele existing electorate has become part of Fairfax, is a sign of his determination to be a team player. He goes on. He goes on to say, success in politics is hard won through long experience. I find it hard to imagine a better candidate to hold the seat. That's what the leader of the opposition had to say. Had to say about uh, Mr. Fisher, the, the member for Fisher. But of course, we know the friendships there because he went to the wedding. He went to the wedding along with the deputy leader of the opposition. With, with friends like this, with friends like this, and then we have, then we have the circumstances whereby the leader of the opposition is only sitting in the chair because he got the member for Fisher's vote when he won the leadership by one single vote. I didn't hear him talk about it being tainted. He was happy to take that vote then. And then we have, then we have the engagement of those opposite, the meetings with Mark McArdle, the meetings with uh, the manager of opposition business, going into going into the speaker's office to have a little drink with the speaker's staff, Mr. Ashby. There were no specific drinks. The meetings, the meetings, multiple meetings with Mal Bruff. Gee, he couldn't have an interest there, could he? So he's running for pre-selection for this seat, trying to knock the bloke off, and he's meeting with the bloke staff about these issues. Joe Hockey, Graf, Clive Palmer met at Coolum Resort over Easter, the sixth of six to ninth of, of, of April. We had we had contact after contact, contact after contact in the lead-up to these allegations being made. And it was a bit slow off the mark the other Sunday when Jonesy was in a spot of bother, but he was pretty quick off the mark on the Saturday morning where the Daily Telegraph splashed, splashed spontaneously. 9.15am he was out there. He did another couple of press conferences the next day, and there were coalition members splashed across the Sunday morning TV programs something they normally avoid like the play. I mean, you're more likely to see this bloke on Late Line or the 7.30 report or Q&A than you are to see a coalition member subjected to scrutiny on a Sunday morning. On a Sunday morning. But that was all OK. That was all OK. And then on the 22nd of April, when the Speaker stepped aside from chairing the parliament, he said this, it's good that the Speaker has stepped aside until these matters can be resolved. That's what he had to say then. That's what he had to say then. He argued that the process currently in place should be put in place and ever since then has continued to just trash that exact process. And we know throughout it all, throughout it all, the no specific knowledge defence yeah. oh, no was specific there. Knowledge. No specific knowledge yeah, defence no was there. And we know, of course, we know, of course, that these alleged text messages, most of them took place prior to the member for Fisher being the speaker, when he was a member of the Liberal National Party, when, when the, the leader of the opposition was happy 
to accept his vote day after day. No, Madam Deputy Speaker, what we're seeing here, what we're seeing here is just the latest, just the latest in the Leader of the Opposition's determination to trash proper processes in this parliament. And it is not appropriate that the parliament just go along with this. What we see is all of the aggression, all of the aggression every day. And today, when I saw the member for Indi out there lecturing us on these issues, I recalled the demonstration outside my office where the member for Indi used taxpayers' funds to fly up to a demonstration with a coffin outside my office where on TV footage for all to see there's a woman grabbing my tie saying that my dead mother would feel ashamed of me and my response on TV. And we remember, of course, we remember the context of this, the demonstration outside the office and, of course, of course, the demonstration which the this Leader of, of the Opposition the was prepared to stand in front of. Julia Bob Brown's bitch. Don't lecture us about sexism when you did nothing to dissociate yourself from this group. When Alan Jones was promoting the demonstration outside my office with all of these signs still there, you sent a front bencher outside of my office interstate to Marrickville to engage in that demonstration, which required mass presence of the Australian Federal Police. If you, if you light the fire, you shouldn't be surprised at what occurs. The Leader of the Opposition called for a people's revolt. He has engaged in language, in language which is unprecedented in this parliament, which has incited people that has said that this isn't a legitimate parliament. He's been a part of saying that, and yet he comes in here and gives it no respect whatsoever. Well, I say to the Leader of the Opposition, this is a step too far to go down this process of moving this resolution today without any notice whatsoever to the government is consistent with his attitude of wrecking, everything. trashing everything that he touches and a failure to grant any common respect. We know, can you try just one thing for the rest of the week? See if you can call the Prime Minister Prime Minister instead of she, and you might have just a smidgen of credibility. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. Think the noes have it. Aye. Ayes have it. Division required. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is the motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass the right to the chamber, the noes to the left. I appoint the tellers for the ayes, the members for Barker and Parks, and the member for Shortland and Chifley tellers for the noes. <coughs> The result of the division is ayes 69, noes 70. The question is therefore negated. <laughs> Could I ask people to quickly desist from walking in front of my chair? The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. I present the following.